Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Steve Isherwood here, Chief Exec of the Institute of Student Employees, um, Student Employers. Um, welcome to today's uh, webinar where we're discussing social mobility. Um, I know, having a look at who's registered, uh, many of you are IEC members, so we'll, we'll know us pretty well, but I know that, that, that some of you um, are new to the IEC and may not have heard us before. Um, we are an organisation in the in the school leaver graduate space that's um, very much involved in student employment employability, um, how the whole labour markets around graduates and student employability works. Um, we're very much an employer-led organisation, so a couple of numbers, so we've got 300 um, employers who are members, um, we also have nearly uh, 100 universities and other education institutions that are, that are members and also about 120 suppliers to the industry. Um, so that's who we are. Um, why are we interested in social mobility? Well, it's um, it's a it's a really important subject for us. Um, we are driven by what our members want us to work on and what they see as an issue. And as I'll explain a bit later in the webinar, you know, this is this is a really hot topic for um, for all our members, particularly employers who are trying to do a lot more involved in this space. Um, I've been involved in in social mobility for a, a number of years. Um, those of you that know me know my previous role. I used to run graduate recruitment at EY, and before that was PwC. So my experience from those industries, although quite a while ago now, is that actually you know this has been something that employers have been working on for for a good long period of of, of time. Um, particularly over the last eighteen months, there's been a a, a group of members of the IC that have been coming together occasionally and looking at this idea of producing more more content for our, our members around the whole social mobility place space um, looking at what we do in terms of research content case studies etc um, and part of the reason for doing this webinar is we've now put a lot of that material online as part of a, a social mobility toolkit um, which you all have access to um, as we go through the slide deck you'll see there's a, a couple of links um, for whether it's in our website um, it's open access it's not behind the paywall so you can can get to that um, and one message I'm keen to get across is that this is a an ongoing piece of work um, we want to add more case studies uh, to 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 our materials um, as you know we get more research as different practices develop we want to make sure that we're the forefront of that so it's no by no means a static piece of work um, I should also mention um, AGCAS um, so we've been very much in the mix with with AGCAS on this and AGCAS have also produced a toolkit which is um, very much more from a from a HE context um, whereas ours is more from the employer context so and, but there is definite overlap between the two so I suggest you use that resource and our resource as well. Um, the other thing I mentioned is that if you weren't aware already the Social Mobility Commission um, they have a, a, a toolkit we seem to be getting swamped by toolkits um, that, that's coming out shortly so we are also in conversation with those and very much keen to share best practice and share content and knowledge where we where we have. Um, I mean this is an, an issue that cuts right across the political divide. It's 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 something that um, it's something that that is very important politically, it's very important socially, and it's also very important for, for businesses. I've, I've said it's been around for quite a while as a debate, um, and the research has been, been around for a long time. That shows particularly in the UK, we have, have, a, have a real issue with, with social mobility. And, you know, let's be honest and talk about the UK class system, which is very different to, to many other countries. Um, and I know that actually the diversity agenda, when it very much um, started to grow in the UK, didn't really think about social mobility, it thought about other characteristics. But I personally think that social mobility as an issue underpins a lot of those other areas as well. So I think we're all pretty common with the headlines. It's been in the headlines again um, um, this year already around actually, you know, who's getting through the education systems, who's getting into the best university. It's on the BBC website um, today talking about the work that universities are doing and I will I will very much come on to that as well. But talking about actually what, what's the reality, what does the data show us? You know, the Sutton Trust has put out a considerable number of of, of reports and pieces actually that have, that have told us what's happening in the market. You know, it is very much true that actually somebody who went to an independent school or a private school is much more likely to get into, um, you know, a, a higher ranked university than somebody who went to a state school or somebody from a, from a poorer, poorer household. Um, I've used a couple of data points here from the, the, the Sutton Trust around the, the legal sector. 
Um, they've done some work tracking what happens with barristers. Um, I won't go through that in, in detail, but basically that what you'll see, and I've got some data there going back to um, sort of 89, 2004, and then 2016. And what, we'll, what we see is that the situation hasn't changed very much. Um, so despite all the efforts, all the resources, all the extra hard work that everybody's doing, actually those numbers stay um, stubbornly static. Um, so there's the whole social issue around this, why it's, why it's important. And I think if they wanted to spin off into a debate around politics, you look at issues around politics, you look about look at issues around um, those young people who, who don't get into the education university system. You look at some of the more deprived areas, whether they're inner city, rural and coastal. There are, there are some big problems that are, are part of this, this debate. This data I'm showing you now, when you actually look at the UK compared to other countries, um, there is a much stronger link in the UK between what your, what your parents earn and what you will earn as an individual. Basically what it's saying that, that you look at where somebody is, the social class they are at age four, and despite everything else that might happen, it's actually where they're at, at age four will pretty much determine where they, where they end up in life. Um, you look at other countries, as this chart shows, and that's much more prevalent. That systems within society, the education system, that's what makes a difference to, to outcomes. So, you know, this kind of busts the myth that the UK is, is a meritocracy. I think it's also worth looking at the US. It's interesting, um, having spent a bit of time in the US, the subject is slightly different over there, but it, but it is an issue over there. It comes from a different point. But actually, there's also that issue in the US of actually, again, where you start in life um, has a very strong um, influence on where you end up, despite a lot of the, 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 you know, the misconception that the US is, is very much a meritocracy. Um, I've tried to find data on this for the UK, but I've not, not found it, but I've read comments that say this, is, this, this kind of portrays what's happened in, in the UK. Um, when we talk about social mobility, it's worth thinking about what can, what can drive social mobility. And when we look at the very much the post-war years, actually there was a, a, a significant expansion in the economy, particularly at those more skilled level jobs. And that naturally lifted a considerable number of people actually out of poverty. Um, you'll have read maybe about stuff around the growth of the middle classes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a lot of that was driven by, by, by that kind of expansion in the post-war economies. But actually, when you go back to, you know, sort of the, the, the 70s and early 80s, that's where you started to see a real diversion. And basically what's happened in reality, that there's an elite that have seen their actual, their, their net wealth, their, their net family incomes, their retained assets has grown significantly. But actually, everybody else has stayed pretty static. So because the cost of things has, has fallen, you know, we can get, get more for our money in a sense, but actually our, our real income, real assets for the majority of people um, in society, particularly the UK and the US, just hasn't really changed since, since those days in the, in the early 80s. And that's particularly acute since the, since the financial crash. So I think that helps explain some of the, the contents around the context around what's 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 what has been happening in society and what what's been driving it. So there is there is obviously a very much a, a social moral argument for actually trying to improve uh, social mobility and deal with deal with some of these issues. But I think it's also worth mentioning the business case. And one of the things we have put into our toolkit is this is some advice and guidance around actually how you you build the business case you know what's the what's the what's the commercial imperative what's the the organizational need to actually tackle this rather than just have it as a kind of a, a nice thing to do I guess for, for the organization have as a have as a CSR piece of work well there's lots of research coming out there out now that shows actually how diversity in general um, creates a, a better organization so I've listed some of the the, the comments there and again on our website we've got links to some of these reports if you want to, to access them. So part of it is research showing that companies actually um, with a poor diversity track record actually don't get the same financial returns that do, whether that's profit figures um, or whether it's stock market valuations, etc. So McKinsey have done a lot of work in that space. Um, there's also research coming through showing around how diverse teams make 
better decisions. Um, you know, they actually make 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 better long term decisions than teams that are that are less diverse, which is better for organisation. Um, and there's also um, this point that I hear mentioned by many organisations around actually it's about reflecting your your customer base. If you're if the makeup of people in your organisation doesn't represent who are your customers, well. Um, how are you going to adapt, define the right products, you know, to to, to meet that, that customer need? And I think there's also this piece around actually, you know, demographic changes. You know, um, I put it here: there just aren't enough white middle-class males to meet resourcing needs in in the future. When we look at the UK in particular, um, we are in reality pretty much at full employment. Um, those of you who know the IC's work will know that our data shows every year our employers do not fill all their vacancies. They could hire more people than they actually do. Um, we have Brexit coming down the pipe, which 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 could limit actually the amount of resource we have available, as as um, depending on what happens with with EU migration. Um, the actual number of young people in the UK has been declining steadily for a number of years, and it's only really just starting to turn. Um, so if you're very active in the student pace, recruiting people either sort of coming out of school or out of universities, there are just fewer bodies in the ground. Yeah, sorry, on the ground um, that are. Um, that are available for to recruit, so that is driving employers to 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 look to different different talent streams, and we've definitely seen that, that happening over over a number of years. Um, just one thing to comment actually on the, on the webinar, you'll you'll see there's a, a a, a questions box. I won't deal with questions as we as we go along, um, but if you have got a question coming out of um, um, some of the stuff that we're talking about here, please put it onto that question box, and I'll make sure at the the end of the, the slide deck that I go through, um, I'll answer any questions that that you have. So I've summed that up here very much on this on this quote from um, a McKinsey report: "Why diversity Why diversity matters." And I'll, I think it really is worth reading out. Um, More diverse companies, we believe, are better able to win top talent and improve their customer orientation, employee satisfaction, and decision making, and all that leads to a virtuous cycle of increasing returns. And we're very much seeing that is also behind what's driving a lot of lot of activity in this in this space. And also, we don't think those pressures are going to go away. So this is very much actually a a a area that employers are going to invest um, more and more of their time in. And we're seeing that actually in 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 the activities that that in, that in, that, in, that, in, that employers are undertaking in the diversity space. So this slide here comes from our 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 our, our survey that we did last September, our annual survey on what's happening in the market. So we ask employers, what are your diversity priorities, and actually, and how do you rank those priorities? So you'll see that gender and ethnicity are still very much up there. And um, actually, we found last year that on all areas of of diversity, actually there was a shift from a medium to a high focus. So actually an increased focus in this area. Um, particularly around social mobility, um, I took this role seven years ago. If I go back at the data we produced then, less than 20% of employers um, were had this as, as an area that they were doing work on. And we now see that it's, it's the actual figure, I think is roughly about 76, 77% of employers have this as a high or medium priority. So a real increase um, in efforts employers are, are putting into this space. Um, we asked why are they doing that? Why this increase? And it's interesting. The strongest rationales were actually the desire to secure the best talent. Um, 76% of employers say that's why they were increasing this as, a, as an area of priority. Um, next on the list was accessing new pools of talent, 61%, um, and this desire to represent the diversity of customers, 54%. So actually, it's interesting collating that data. Going back to what I was saying previously, it's that business case it's that it's that need to have a stronger business is what's what's driving employers to to do this so this is the link to where the um social mobility piece is on our on our website where this toolkit is um you can also get it by by the knowledge section on our website um and this is how we we've, we've structured our content so far um and i guess this kind of is how we see employers employers tackling the issue and also how we would recommend employers do approach this as, as, as an area. So first of all, it is important to get that strategy right. You know, it's building that business case. It's making sure there's a real concrete reason to be doing um, something in this space. It's understanding what's happening out there in the markets. It's what's understanding in your in your in your organisation. 
I think one of the growing topics in this area is also this idea of intersectionality and we definitely find this in the social mobility space. A number of employers have told us that when they tackle social mobility actually they see you know um, a, a marked improvement in actually how well they do in other areas of diversity um, particularly gender and, and ethnicity so um, and when you look at the toolkit you'll see that we've got links to some of those reports I talked about um, and also links to some of the, the, the data sources you can get that will, will help inform that, that business case and, and drive the need for action. Um, we then split actually what um, how, how, how employers should approach this into three areas. First of all, there's the whole outreach and attraction piece. That's how do you actually find and talk to the talent that you want to hire? Um, then there's very much the selection and assessment piece. So that's how do you assess those people? How do you make fair, 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 uh, fair assessment? So you actually get the right people coming through the door. And then also the development and retention space and what do you actually do to, um, retain and develop those people that you've actually put all that effort into hiring. The one thing I, I, I really think is important to stress is that importance of measurement and it's doing the, the, the right measuring. Actually, if you're not measuring, then actually how do you know that what you are, um, what your plans are, what your strategies are, um, are actually heading in the right direction? How are you going to actually measure the improvements that you make? So if you don't do the right the right measurement in the first place, actually, it makes it very difficult to, to develop the right strategies. And I'll talk a little bit more around actually um, some of the areas that, that, that you can measure in this, in this webinar. Um, I thought it was worth showing some of the hiring data because again, this shows actually, this starts to show where that use of data and measurement can help identify where the problems are. So we pulled together information from, from the employers that we survey and work with, um, and we collated data on actually, you know, what are the typical proportions of, of hires in those industries from a number of different, different areas? And how does that compare to the UK population average? And how does that compare to, to actually what's the, what's the population within higher education? Um, so you'll see, let's take gender at the start, you'll see actually um, the average proportion of hires of female graduates across um, all the sectors that we work with, and there's, a, and there's a fair number of them, actually the proportion of hires is 44% female. Um, when you actually look at the UK population average, just over 50%, and then you look at actually the number of females within higher education, and you see that, well, actually, if employers were mirroring the demographics of the student population, actually they should really be getting a 56% female intake. So if you're not achieving that as, as, as a business, you are, there's a signal there that you might be um, underperforming or you're not, um, you know, you're not reaching out across the entire, entire talent base. The data on social mobility is much harder to get. So I included those figures here, but there is one caveat with those with those numbers and that actually there are still a relatively small number of employers measuring this information still so it's nowhere near as many employers gave us this data as they did for, for some of the areas but the data we do have shows actually the nature of the challenge so let's look at um, individuals who went to state school so individuals went to state school make up 94 percent of the population even within higher education, despite a lot of the grief that higher education gets, 91% um, of students um, went to a state school. But when we look at the data we've got for our employers, only 58% of graduate hires went to a state school. So that shows that actually if you went to that, that, that independent school, that private school, um, you are more likely to get through your average graduate selection process, which says that our industry has a challenge. I think if we were able to dig in that, those numbers even further, it might paint um, actually worse of a picture because I don't intend to do it on this webinar, but there's a whole debate around some state schools, grammar schools, you know, are there some state schools that actually function in a way um, like independent schools in terms of the, the demographics of the people who go to those, those schools? So which takes me back to an earlier point, you know, despite all the resources, all the campaigns, all the extra money and, and opportunity costs put into this area, have we actually seen um, seen a, 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 a shift in actually who is getting into organisations? The Social Mobility Commission um, produced a report, I think this came out last year, um, 
and this is one of the reasons that part of the toolkit focuses on that whole outreach and attraction piece that actually um, this is much more complex an area to tackle than just you know the posting of a of a job ad of, of using kind of the marketing channels that maybe maybe everybody uses within the industry because the people that you want to reach may not know you as an organization you know they may not have the peer groups um, have had the influences that actually point out where your kind of opportunities um, are um, it's quite interesting to think where students are at pre-universities um, and there's a real difference between the north and the south so in the northwest for example 65 percent of students in the northwest who go to university get there through um, colleges, whereas actually in London and the South East, it's only about 35, 36%. So there immediately you've got a difference in, 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 in targets. And actually in the colleges, um, the college populations do tend to be more diverse. They do tend to have people from more lower socioeconomic groups. And those are the groups that won't know how the market works. They won't necessarily know actually what they need to do to develop the kind of skills that you'll be looking for as recruiters um, you know all those volunteering part-time work or even when they are doing those activities they may not actually recognize that what they're doing are creating the skills that, that employers want so concepts like transferable skills, you know, understanding that that part time job, you know, you've got in a supermarket where you're dealing with difficult customers, you're taking on board responsibility. Um, you know, that that's what a lot of employers are looking for when they're looking for examples. They, they just won't know that. So I think it's really important to to actually work a lot more closely, um, particularly earlier in the pipeline um, to help people understand what the skills are you need and also also develop those skills um, and I think there's a real opportunity at the moment so um, historically within higher education and those of you um, who are participating in this webinar who um, um, you'll probably be, be acutely aware of this um, historically that universities were measured more on who got in so it was actually around widening participation it's um, you know what's the makeup of students enter university the office for students is still saying that's important but actually um, is is measuring and is looking for more evidence and more work and have sponsored some of this work around actually what happens once those university students get into university so it's around actually you know how well are they doing university are they staying are they getting good grades and also are they actually progressing through higher education and getting into into that highly skilled employment so i think there's a real opportunity there for both employers and educators to work more closely to together on this is connects that widening participation piece through the careers and employability work that universities do and into, into employment. I think there's a real opportunity where um, now the stars are aligned to actually um, um, to make us better in that space. Um, I mentioned the importance of, um, of, of data and market research and, and measuring. Um, this link on here, some of you may know this, Higher Education Statistics Agency, they have a wealth of information on their website that you can access. So if you think about this as understanding your target market, where are the people that you might want to talk about? So they have, you know, performance indicators for widening participation within universities. They have data split by demographics. So if you want to understand um, where the students you might want to target are, which institutions are they at, which courses are they on, then the HESA is very much somewhere you can go and, and explore. Um, there is data you can pay for, but there's an awful lot of stuff of theirs that is, that is online that you can just access. I know back to my days as, um, as an employer and a recruiter, um, I use the HESA data to, to think about where could we target differently? Why might there be um, you know, a, a, a different institution to one that we might typically have gone to in terms of finding particular candidates that, that we wanted to hire? So I'd absolutely recommend um, you have a look at the, the HESA website. So that's the, 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 uh, some comments on the attraction and selection piece. Like I said, I think you have to go earlier in the pipeline and it's a lot more complex and it's, I'll come back to this um, towards the end, it's that idea of upskilling of actually you, you, you have people who you may be targeting that, that need more inputs than you might typically do um, than when you are, are um, you may have hired, you may have done when outreaching and doing, doing your hiring attraction activities in the past.
Um, I want to talk now a little bit around selection and assessment. Um, again, this is a huge topic and we could spend a whole day talking about this. Um, first point to make is around the measurement piece. So it is harder than measuring um, things like gender ethnicity. Um, you know, the, 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 the questions that you could ask are more varied and actually it's more complex to understand what those what those what those measures mean um, the government did do a lot of work on this relatively recently um, and published um, and published their recommendations of the type of questions that employers should ask um, alongside gender and race um, on the application form to understand who's joining their, their organizations they actually also recommend you ask it of your existing employees so you understand where you, where you are at within your, your organizations. Um, again, this is this is just a screenshot of our of our toolkit page. The the link is on there where you can actually get um, the full detail of those of those recommendations around what you should ask and how you should ask it. But basically they say you should be asking around the type of school somebody went to, the qualifications their parents um, achieved, for example, are they the first in their family to go to university? What were those parental occupations um because again they, they will have an influence did somebody get free school meals and also asking people to self-assess you know what do you think you know your your and where would you assess yourself in terms of socioeconomic background working class middle class etc et, et um and talking to organizations that we work with they say that actually there's not one single one of those measures that you can use that actually in a sense define somebody that actually what you have to do are um look at um, you know sort of three of those indicators um, and to use the language of you know rare he would do some work with you know you're looking for three flags to say actually this is somebody that that you might need to look at at differently um, and going back to that 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 data piece if you're really going to understand your selection process um, it's important that you understand what's happening within that selection process so um, this data isn't to do with uh, social mobility. I, I pulled it because it's some work that we did with the engineering sector a couple of years ago that looked actually what happened at um, to, to female students who applied for jobs in energy engineering sector. And actually what that data shows is that female students are more likely to get through the selection process when they apply. So at all stages in the process, they were more likely to get through. So actually what that data says in a snapshot that for that sector, those kind of employers, it's an attraction issue um, or it's an issue of there aren't enough people actually, there aren't enough females studying those subjects in the first place that they're, they're hiring from. So that tells those organisations that's where they need to put a disproportionate amount of their, their efforts. Now, if you do similar work with your own selection processes, actually you might find a different story. You might find that candidates from more diverse backgrounds aren't getting through your assessment centers. Or maybe they're getting all the way through and they're having an offer made, but they're not accepting that offer. Or there's a problem with your initial screening. So it's that kind of level of data and analysis that will help you understand what's happening, but also help you inform your business case and your organization of what they need to do to, to, to tackle the, the issue. So this is what we find employers are doing at the moment. So we ask employers, actually to, to tackle uh, social mobility what are you actually putting in place in terms of selection and assessment so nearly 20 percent now have uh, name blind applications so recruiters assessors um, interviewers don't see the actual name of an individual 17 um, percent are saying they screen out uh, university data so they don't know which which institution somebody went to um, We've seen very much over the over the last few years an increase in the use of contextualized data. So going back to a couple of slides ago when I talked about those things you can ask around um, um, you know, somebody's background and then also using information about the school they went to and, and grade data within that school. Actually, by using that kind of contextualized data, it can help you think about um, you know, what kind of weight you put to somebody's academic background. So relating that to the last point around, it's actually it's a lot fewer employers use um, A-level grades UCAS points as a barrier than than you might think because of the amount of press it press it gets setting a minimum standard. Um, degree classification is used much more much more much more often. Um, I think it's over fifty percent of employers ask for at least a, a, a two one from their their applications. But it's interesting those that that do use A-level grades as as a measure. Um, Many of them are now using contextualized data. So 
in simple terms, this means that somebody who went to an elite school who get three A's when everybody gets three A's. Contextualized data doesn't say don't look at that person, it says still look at them. But what it will say is somebody that gets uh, three B's um, from a, a school where the average is two C's and a D, well, that individual has, has outperformed their peer group. And that is evidence and research out there and universities, a lot of universities have been using this system for, for you know, well over a decade now. But actually outperforming your peer group can be a better predictor of um, success um, and they're using the data in, in, in that context. So that's another area where employers do more work. And we're also seeing this happen more in the selection and, and assessment process, this idea of coaching candidates either face-to-face -face or digitally. I think there's been a significant um, movement um, shift in, in thought processes around, um, you know, you just create a level playing field, but using this suite of tests and assessments, actually, um, that's a fair playing field. Everyone will get through that process equally. That's fine. Actually, what employers, many employers are telling us that actually, you know, if a candidate is not is not aware of what an assessment centre might involve, has, has you know never been in a you know a a a corporate type environment, for example, actually, um, it's not a level playing field. You know, they're starting from a from a from a from a much lower base point, and we know a number of employers who have put that coaching in place, and it's made a significant difference it still means the selection process is rigorous and it's fair um you know and they're, they're they're selecting the right people but actually doing some of that that upfront coaching is actually changing um the nature of who gets through that selection process so that again might be something that you, that you might want to think about um the top area of where employers do put their activities um is is in this idea of um of of giving diversity training to people involved in the selection process. So that's interviewers, assessors, people from the business, people out there are, are, are campus, on, on campus. Um, and we're also finding this is, is starting to, to come through into the development and retention process. Um, I think at the moment we're a bit lighter on some of the content we've got around development and retention because a lot of employers are still focused on that uh, attraction piece and that selection piece. Um, and I think also I've talked about some of the difficulties of measuring an attraction stage. This gets even harder to measure when you're talking about development and retention. But we are seeing evidence of employees looking more closely at this because what they're finding is a bit like what might have happened at some institutions with higher education. Just because you get in doesn't mean you get on. Um, and often it's it's less obvious that that's happening because people will leave at different stages. There won't necessarily be one point where, you know, a bunch of people leave, leave en masse. It's around culture. It's around people fitting in. You know, does the organisation adapt to the individual? Is it an inclusive organisation, or do they expect everybody gets in to conform to a to a to a certain way of of working? I think the issue around unconscious bias is quite interesting here because I hear different schools of thought. Some people saying, "Yep, unconscious bias training really good. We make sure we do that." So I'm saying that actually, there's some evidence that unconscious bias training makes the the matter wor worse. Um, an interesting comment that I, I heard recently was that actually it's really difficult to spot unconscious bias in yourself. We are rubbishing at, at, at seeing the mistakes we make. But actually, if you create a culture where people can spot it in others and call it out, you're much more likely to spot it in, in somebody else. So I think there's some really interesting work happening um, in that whole diversity training piece. And I think we'll see more developments coming coming forward. Um, I mentioned the toolkits. Um, Quick reminder on questions. So I've only got uh, two or three more slides to go through. Then we'll then we'll switch to to, to questions. Um, I mentioned that actually we, we we in a sense we're at the start of of, of this this toolkit, um, even though though we've now launched it now. Um, this is um, what we see as a, an all encompassing um, approach to to. Uh, social mobility within an organization and I won't go through this whole graphic it's a, just a bit more complex but again it's the strategy doing your outreach and attraction it's selection and assessment it's it, it's development um, but actually it's this importance of monitoring all the way through the process and make sure you've got this cycle and this feedback loop where you're measuring data and you're feeding it back into the system you're making um, adjustments you know this need to upskill your candidates all the way through from the outreach work that you do before anybody even thinks about applying to you, doesn't even know what your industry is, through to actually when they join the organization around 
what it takes to be be successful you know in that development and retention section we talk about mentoring we talk about buddying programs we talk about actually you know the work the extra work you might have to do to help help people be successful then also that constantly managing the business it's making sure the business is is constantly involving removing those biases and is and is and is bought into this for the long time i think one of our, our key messages is that actually just doing a little bit of work around attraction and doing some work on on who gets through the front door you're not necessarily going to fix anything and it's also it's not a quick fix it's the kind of stuff that when you look at it across the board of your organization and you look at these strategies you know informing who gets into the leadership positions actually we can do a lot of work at the student level to change who gets in but it will take time for that to feed through through the system so um if you've got case studies if you've got an area you think that we're missing at the moment if there's a particular piece of analysis or some really good work out there please let us know we're, um, we're very keen to to build this out or even if you think it exists somewhere else tell it is and we can just put a link on our website and and direct other people there you know, this is very much an ongoing going piece of work um, and just a few comments to end on really before before we open for questions i think i said this at the start and i'll reiterate it we do not see this issue going away, um, if only because um, the competition in, in the marketplace, as I said um, at the start, in the UK, um, you know, we're pretty much at full employment, so there's not a massive load of slack in the labour market. Um, there is the issue of a demographic dip. There are fewer actually young people um, out there on, on the ground. Um, we had these issues of, of unfilled vacancies and real skill shortages in certain sectors. Um, and of course, the issues around, you know, what happens as a, as a result of Brexit and how does that affect the labour market. So on a you know, on a purely operational need to get the best talent into your business, if you're not properly tackling the social mobility agenda organizations you are competing with were are um, and they could well be getting a better broader range of talents into their organization that ultimately makes them more successful and um, i mentioned at the start you know the i guess the, the the macroeconomic side of this when you haven't got a significantly expanding economy or a shift in the nature of jobs actually um you're not going to have um um an an uplift in the change in the nature of, of jobs and we do occasionally see a bit of a backlash in this I, anybody who's heard me speak in this before has mentioned the action book by james bloodworth the myth of meritocracy and that kind of comes at it from quite a different angle around you know our meritocracy is right and what does that mean for those that don't succeed so uh, that, that's kind of not the argument i'm going down but this idea that you know if the number of jobs is relatively static then you know as if 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 different people be like you're coming up through the process and up the ladder then actually that means somebody's got to be going on on the way down um and we found in in a work some of the work we've done when it's gone out into the into the press we've seen some aspects of the press pick it up a quite a ne negative slant um um we did some um work on on, on internships and what's happening with internships and we talked about how employers in a very positive way are using internships to to create a more diverse intake and get people to their organizations that they might not have might not have um, seen before and um i won't mention them <laughs> which paper it was but actually they painted that in a pretty pretty negative light as social engineering and um and if you read the comments page comments at the bottom of it you kind of lose a sense to live a little bit um I noticed um, I saw Rowena, um, one of our, our members from TMP, um, tweet something early today. Um, um, a spokesperson for um, the HMC, which is the organisation that's kind of you know the the body for um, independent schools, um, being quite critical of some of the press around universities. And we found the HMC were also put quite a negative angle on this idea of using things like contextualised data, social mobility. So. As we tackle this area harder, um, I think we might see a bit more of that backlash. But I think this this goes to reinforce the point I made at the very start, which is, you know, this is a difficult issue to address. We're talking about, you know, um, cultures. We're talking to about an ingrained way that society operates, and it takes a lot of time and effort and resource to 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 shift that. 
So um, open for questions now. A final link there to the to the social mobility toolkit. Um, this webinar um, is recorded. Um, we will post it onto the website. So you, when we do that, you'll get access to the slides, um, um, and you'll be able to go onto those onto those links. But as I said, actually, if you just type that link into your search engine or go onto the IEC homepage, you'll find it within the knowledge diversity section. Actually, the whole toolkit bit which expands out of there and a lot of the links to the some of the stuff I talked about some of the reports are also um, engaged within that so that's all the content I was going to cover I'm just popping down the, the questions bit here um, and I'll have a look at some of these questions here so question from Natalie so um, so do IC members publish recruitment data um, anecdotally, I have more students applying for times top 100 employers, but are successful at the early stages with little feedback. Um, I don't know specifically um, how many members publish de recruitment data, um, but I know that some do, and I think it's important to have those conversations with those employers that you work with, because um, I definitely know that, that that a lot of employers do measure where students come from. Um, how successful students from a certain uh, institution are, are getting through and I know that some employers um, do actually feed back to universities where students might typically fall down i.e the assessment centre exercises or the application form I think it's employers could do more of because I think it's a way of actually being more effective on campus so I definitely think um, those of you um, within institutions should um, ask for more of that from your employers to say that it will be useful and um, it will be a recommendation. It's something I definitely used to do um, back in the days when I was a recruiter that feeding back that information in a, in a, into the system actually will create better understanding and know what levers need to be pulled and, and shifted. Um, another comment here feels like culture shift is most needed. Yep. Um, Natalie, yeah, great recommendation. BBC Breaking into the Elites, I watched that as well. Um, I think it's probably still on the iPlayer. It was on BBC over the summer and it was all about actually um, individuals getting into into some of those more elite, elite, elite professions. I thought it was a really good programme and it covered a lot of the subjects in depth and highlighted the issues. I think one of the things it didn't touch on quite as strongly as it may have done because it did focus on on a student who was really bright had got a first and I don't think it emphasized enough that actually I mean if we talk to employers getting a first doesn't really make any difference and in a way can be a little bit of a signal that actually that person may have focused too much on their on their studies rather than actually some of those broader skills that you need I mean I'm sure all of us are, um, you know, get this being in this industry. Yes, you've got to have the, the intellectual firepower, the ability to, you know, kind of deal with um, work at the skilled level that employers are, are recruiting to. But you actually need all those other broader skills as well. You, you need you need both. And I think it's a real challenge in the social mobility space because, again, um, those coming through the pipelines of talent that don't know that or think that actually, you know, academic success, that's something I can really hang on to. You know, that's the true measure of, of my worth. And I'm not saying it's not important, but they may not necessarily understand just how important um, the other side of the coin is. So again, I think that's something that we can all work much harder to get that, that message across. Um, I think a lot of people don't get it, that don't, 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 understand the point that most employers don't really care what people study. 86% of the employers we work with do not measure, um, do, do not recruit by subject discipline. Um, you know, so it's that that has much less of an influence than, than people think. And I think if we can get that message alone out to more people, that will help um, students coming through the system that actually, well, yeah, so if they're not that focused on that, what are they focused on um, to understand that? And I think I said this before, um, a lot of people, particularly from, from some of those widening participation um, backgrounds, you know, they just don't realise that that volunteering work that they're doing or that, that care work they're doing at home or that part-time job they're doing actually has all those um, all those skills that, that, that employers are looking for. And it's helping actually, and again, I know this as a recruiter, you know, you can have an interview that, that hasn't gone particularly well and a casual conversation um, as you walk out the door or asking a student, oh, what are you doing next? And they talk about something they're doing that, that's really good. They just don't see the relevance of the work. So I think the more we can do to get that message out there, the better. Okay, so I think that's all the questions I've had on here. Um, thanks for um, 
thanks for for engaging with us everybody um as i said this is culmination of um a bit of work over the last 18 months really I'm grateful to those people that have helped us do it, um, but let's um, let's keep building these resources and let's keep increasing the understanding of the issues that we're dealing with, and actually all share those 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 ways and means that we can we can we can put in place to make an improvement. Um, and any questions um, to take this forward, or anything you want to add, um, you know, to 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 our work in this area, then please get in touch. If you haven't got my email address already, um, it's on our on our website, so you can go there and connect to me through. Through that that area, um, and as I said, um, this website automatically records by the software that we use. So we'll put this online. So if you want to go back to it, or if you want to spread it around um, your team, so more people can take the time out and 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 look at it, um, that'll be great. Cool. Okay. Thanks for your time. Um, have a good day, everybody.